Greetings. Good evening. My name is Tony Mopley. Tonight we are going to have conversations with Tony Mopley. And we are going to be talking about helping people with technology. And our subject area is going to be disabilities. In the past, I've gone on and shared a lot of my personal history on how we got here. But because of the magnitude of our subject tonight, I thought we might just get started with uh, introducing our guest, uh, Ms. Laura Thompson. And we are gonna be having a conversation about disabilities for adults and children, how technology can help them and support them. And then we will um, do, a, do our introduction with her and we will have questions. And so I wanna thank all of my guests and my special guest, Ms. Laura Thompson. And so with that, I need to do a couple of household things and I apologize for that. And, uh, and so thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, so let's go to our first question. Thank you, uh, Talat, for, for reading our questions tonight. My first question is from Tlaloc Lopez Waterman, <laughs> me. Uh, what are the best ways to be an ally with those with needs that are different from my own? Oh, we can't hear you, Laura. Uh-oh. Got you now. Okay, I don't know yeah. what happened, sorry. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to jump right in and kind of address that question first and then back up and kind of give you a little bit of my background. The most simple way to help somebody that has needs that are unlike your own is to step out of your comfort zone and ask questions. 90% of the time, whether you're dealing with somebody who is deaf, whether you're dealing with somebody who is blind, somebody that has intellectual disabilities or whatever the situation is, they 90% of the time know what they need. They can normally and always, 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 if you're gonna help, offer, ask if your help is to be accepted, and if they say no, let it go. That is okay. probably one of the biggest um, recommendations I can give is if you see something unfair step in if you if you're able but if you're told no let it go um, there have been many situations in my life where people have um, attempted to step in and help without telling me they were there or I they may have been coming at me from an angle and I did not see them and you can scare somebody really, really badly, particularly with visual disabilities. Re that's why you do the, you know, you offer, you introduce yourself. And if you're not sure how to help, ask them if they need help and ask them what help they need. Um, we are the expert. We are the experts in our own situations. Laura, let me just, let me. First, let me apologize to you because I did not give you a chance to actually tell us who you are. So I want you to do that. And then we will um, we'll go back to the questions. And um, yeah, I need you to, to tell, I mean, I know who you are and I know how passionate you are. Um, but for those who are listening, um, and then who may watch this later on YouTube, tell us who you are. Okay, my name is Laura Thompson, and I was born with a condition called optic nerve hypoplasia. Um, 
also known as septo-optic dysplasia. So I have the optic nerves did not form correctly. So I kind of explain it like a loose telephone wire. Those of us who are old enough to remember when telephones actually had wires and weren't cell phones. Um, or, you know, like, or the other thing for the younger ones I use is like a, like a, a in and out internet connection. Um, the information that my eye takes in does not pass to my brain the way everybody else's does. It's, it's lossy, for lack of a better term. It may be 20 to 40% of the information that I take in actually makes it to the brain for processing. Who, who would you say has been your, your biggest advocate? I've had some amazing mentors in my life. Um, from through high school, um, I had several people that were um, like extra parents to me. I had a teacher in um, high school, um, Mrs. Momeyer. She was our choir director. She was actually the music department chair. And she was one of my biggest advocates. I think she was one of the people that taught me how to stand up for myself and um, and actually going back further than that I had a dance teacher I took ballet when I was in elementary school and this was in the early 80s prior to the laws for the Americans with Disabilities Act but um, Miss Joan Van Dyke took the time to work with me and teach me and I actually excelled pretty well until I had some other health issues come up um, around my disability, but she didn't have to, but she believed so much in her students that each student was a person. And we, you know, she taught group classes, but she tweaked things very individually. She kept her class sizes small so that she was able to do that. And that was something that, um, you know, I, I was talking to her here a couple weeks ago and I said, you know, you are part of the reason that I believe in myself today. Fantastic. Um, I just want to share just a little bit, um, and I think that you'll be able to identify with this. Um, my mother-in-law, um, who was passed away several years ago, um, was a very unique woman, and I'll get to the point of why I'm bringing her up. Um, her son, my brother-in-law, um, had uh, a hearing impairment. And the reason why I asked you about your advocacy was because she was probably the biggest advocate that I knew personally. Um, she was able to fight through the system in order to try to get her son what he needed because of his hearing impairment. And she went beyond the call of duty. So much so that, that after um, uh, having her five children, she decided to go back to college, to go to college while her oldest three were attending college. And she graduated uh, the same year that my wife graduated. But the story doesn't end there. So um, her oldest, her, her second oldest grandchild was born with autism. And so again, she put on her advocacy shoes and began to fight the local school system to ensure that her grandson got what he needed. And I bring that up because I think it's important for us to understand that parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts and family members have to galvanize themselves together and do what it takes to help their child or their parent 
or the adult in their lives that has a disability. Yes, I totally agree with you. And we'll we'll talk about, you know, how that how that might need to look. But I lift up uh, Mrs. Catherine, Mrs. Eunice Catherine Richard, because she was an example to me. And as I was on my journey and, and dealing with uh, supporting students, she would she would often take me with her to the different trainings and uh, seminars that were going on that would help her help her grandson navigate the waters of uh, disabilities and autism. So. I know that I, I don't want to stop there, but I just wanted to make a point of mentioning that because, um, you know, without going into a whole lot of detail, I had a dream that she, she's passed away and I had a dream that she recently, that she and I was having a conversation. And in that dream, she told me some specific things that, um, that I needed to share with my wife and her siblings. But most importantly, she shared some things that I needed to do. And um, one of the things that I want to lift up um, is that she and I would have a lot of conversation about um, providing and uh, supporting um, independence for my nephew. And uh, I thought that I was applying enough pressure. But in this dream, she told me that I had not. And so what I want to say to, to all of you who may have a person with disabilities in their lives, that because they have a disability does not mean that they have an excuse for not being the best person that they can be. And that's the reason why I'm just lifting this up. It's important for us to understand that. And so Laura, I I, kind of feel like you can can speak to that um, immensely about uh, the importance of being independent and some of the things that need to take place in order for someone with disabilities to be independent. Yes. Um, And I'm going to say, I'm going to make the blanket statement right now that every student, every person is different. Their um, needs are different. There is no cookie cutter approach to accommodating disabilities. Um, Getting to know the student, getting to know the person. Tony, I know you taught in the, you know, you taught special education for a while. And um, it is it's that it's that individual approach and um don't judge a book by its cover get to know ask questions and for the parents out there you if you don't know what your child is entitled to there is a law out there called the individuals with disabilities act there is a link to it in my resource um list and also section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, besides the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the Individuals with Education or Individual Ed- Dis- Individuals with Disabilities Education Act has a lot of very deep language. And I I didn't learn it overnight. It's it's a process. Um, there are things that the school are required to do in a K through 12 setting for students that are not always empowering for the student. I know I see it working at the college level. Students with disabilities coming into the college level, so a lot of them don't even realize they have accommodations. Um, they don't know that now they're under the ADA, and this is a whole other topic, but the, how to advocate for themselves. So as much as the parents need to learn, age appropriate, you need to have your child involved. You know, if there's something going on at school, you know, and your child comes home and says, you know, Bobby's picking on me or whatever. 
most parents are going to call the teacher. I encourage you at age appropriate levels to educate all children about how to advocate for themselves. Not be angry, not be accusatory, but facts and actions. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for that. Um, for the panelists, just quickly want to interject here. For the panelists who have things to say about the questions, you may raise your hand and Tony can uh, call on you. Yes, Tony, would you, could somebody monitor the gallery view and let me know if somebody has a hand up because I'm not going to be able to see it? Absolutely, we will. Um, and then I'm just going to uh, uh, mention as well, uh, um, really quickly, we've got some good questions coming in. And for those of you that are, uh, are here with us, please uh, uh, keep asking these great questions. And if you're on YouTube, then um, perhaps uh, you'll want to come and, and be part of the Zoom at some point and ask questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ray, yes, sir. I, I just like to, oh, oh, I'm getting feedback from myself here for a oh. moment. At any rate, um, I would just like to address like the, first to address the first question. Come back to me in a minute. I've, I've got two devices on. Sorry. That's okay, Ray. There's no problem. Okay. Um, Chalak, let's just go to the next question. Okay. Uh, let's try this. Okay. Um, Addressing the first question, what can you do to help people? You know, how do you get started in this? And I found I have had experience with both the deaf community and uh, the spinal injury community. Uh, and uh, I gave glider rides to people in the spinal community. I, I designed uh, electronic aids for the deaf community. And I learned sign language. I'm not great at it. I'm not an interpreter. But uh, anyway... To help people in any of those areas, or anyone who is different than you are, you have to be intentional. You have, because all of these people that are slightly different in some way, or you see them as different, uh, you're going to be uncomfortable at first, not knowing how to approach them are they delicate? Might I hurt their feelings? Might I say the wrong thing? You have to be intentional. Go to them and treat them like any other person. They will tell you how to behave. They will tell you what they want and what they don't want and what to do and what not to do. But you have to make that first approach intentional. And, uh, once you do, I mean, let, let me just give you an example. When I first got involved with the spinal injury people, I was scared to death I was going to hurt them. And, and, and even taking them up in these glider rides, and it was suggested that I do teach aerobatics in a glider. And it was suggested, uh, oh, ask Ray, to, he, one of the paraplegics said, ask Ray to do a loop. And I immediately went to one of the nurses that was w with the group, and I said, we pull four Gs when we do a loop. We weigh four times our normal weight. Might I damage their spine further or something? She said, you can't hurt them. The, the specific people that were our clients said, go for it. And I did, and they enjoyed it. And Fantastic. Uh, you... And furthermore, I was delicate in my speech around them at first. Nowadays, I tease them. I kid them. I, <laughs> they're just people just like Absolutely. us. They just have some small difference. But in 99% of, you know, they're us. So, but you have to be intentional to break down those fears and to jump in there and get over your stuff. Laura, am I on to something? I was, I was just going to say thank you because you just basically took everything I said and put it into a nice, neat little package where I was kind of rambly and 
Thank you. Yes. Laura, let me say you're good. No, you are good. You don't have to apologize. You're good. And so uh, let's, let's go to the next question. All Thank right, you, we have a question from John Pewitt. Um, how can we better advocate those with disabilities or for those with invisible disabilities? Invisible disabilities are tough, but it's about, um, it's a sensitivity um, and it's, but you can't be afraid. Again, it comes back to that communication. If you know somebody who has an invisible disability or if you yourself have an invisible disability i do find that it's hard to advocate for yourself when your disability is invisible um and it is um i don't have a great answer to lock do you have something to say can you just uh explain what that is for us yes. um the, for those you. of us that don't know thank you um thank you sir Invisible disabilities are a lot more of your intel, um, slight intellectual, sometimes dyslexia can be considered an invisible disability depending upon the setting. Anything that you might not, if somebody's deaf, quite often it's going to be very obvious. If somebody is totally blind and uses a long cane or a guide dog, that's going to be more obvious. But there are those disabilities that are not obvious when you first meet the person um uh, some some autisms can be that absolutely i was just sure. about to say you're not you're not 100 percent sure what's going on with them and that's again back to that sensitivity intentionality and communication um and the people that needs and you need to be sensitive when somebody says to you i need x to you know, really think about what they're telling you they need. Um, because the other side of this is service providers and um, teachers and providers of content that don't think about these things when, when somebody makes a request. Uh, Laura, I, I just wanted to ask, um, could you talk about how um, testing, um, can help with that in terms of maybe on the college level or even in, in high school as far as identifying um, disabilities when is when it can be an, an invisible disability? Yes, um, I don't do a lot with the testing. I do know how to refer out for testing. Um, Quite often where we see it with the invisible disabilities is in that first semester grades at the college level. Um, and that's something else that you have to, I'm very intentional about. If I see students that are struggling at the end of their first semester, I call them in, I sit them down, and I ask them the, the open-ended question of what do you think went wrong this semester? And from those answers, I'm able to pare down a little bit further um, to see if there's something that I think needs to be evaluated. We have every, every federally funded university and school must have somebody that is responsible on their campus or in their school district for disability testing, disability identification, and disability accommodations. Unless that is in your job title, it's not your job to know necessarily what to do, but who to connect them with. That is a great person to get, to become an ally, to get to, get to know them, get to know what they do, get to know their referral process, and make them an ally. Can you, can you share a little bit about um, what, you, what you actually do on your job? Um, if it's if it's okay, yes. and if if you don't mind lifting up your university, that's fine as well. Yes, I am actually an academic ath let me start over athletic academic specialist for Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas's track teams, men's and women's track, men's and women's tennis, and volleyball. Prior to that, I was an academic advisor in our undergraduate advising center and I did our Department of Health and Kinesiology, 
three majors in our business school and um, several other majors were in and out of my care over the two and a half years I was in the undergraduate advising center. Um, so now I deal with all majors, all levels, freshman through graduate student, but I deal specifically with our athletes on those teams. So my job has changed a little bit. Um, but Fantastic. I, but I love my job now because part of my job is to support those, those student athletes. Um, NCAA, we are a Division I school. So we have very, pretty high bar requirements for our athletes as far as progression towards degree and academic standards. So I'm the one that when they're having trouble in a class, I'm the first one they should contact. And then it's my job to figure out, do we need a tutor? Do we need academic coaching? Do I need a consult by disability services? And that is so, a passion of mine. That is, that's fantastic. So. I, I guess what I want to do right now is is to tie in how you are doing the job that you're doing. And at the same time, you have this wealth of knowledge that you you share often with us that are a part of office hours. Um, how you are integrating that part of your life with this this passionate part of your life if, if you don't mind sharing that as well yes um i guess the best place to start is that if it wasn't for technology i would not be able to do a lot of the things i do um i i am a jaws user i am a zoom text user which jaws is a uh, job jaws stands for job access with speech so it is a screen reader. Zoom text is a screen magnifier, and they come together packaged at the um, university and in, in, uh, enterprise level in something called Zoom text fusion because they're literally fusing the screen reader with the magnifier. And um, it presents a lot of challenges. Um, the uh, WAIM, which is a... Um, accessibility, web accessibility um, organization just did a study and they took 1 million websites and they discovered that over 1 million of the most popular websites and they discovered that 90% of them have some kind of error on them that prevents a screen reader from accessing them fully. Fantastic. So what are some of the other technologies you might be using? Um, I, I use a lot of speech to text because of the fact that the information doesn't get necessarily from my eyes to my brain. Uh, editing what I type is more difficult because my eyes think, my brain fills in what my eyes aren't, what it thinks I typed, not what's actually there. Um, I use a lot of Uber and Lyft have been a godsend to me. Um, I do obviously I cannot drive. My vision's literally about twenty over eight hundred. I I have no hopes of ever getting a driver's license. So um, the the advent of Uber and Lyft to compete with the taxi companies to keep prices down has been a it's been a help to me. Fantastic. We can debate <laughs> later. <laughs> Fantastic. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, what are those mistakes that they're finding on those web pages? And how can we, as, you know, people that may have a web page, how, you know, where can we send that? Who can we have a look at that to see if ours has, you know, issues, um, that they can identify and help us correct. There are quite a few web aim. It's W A I M. Um, and I can throw that. That is not on the resource list. I will go back in and put that in afterwards. Um, they have an accessibility. They actually have a Google Chrome 
a plugin now called WAVE for accessibility checking. It's not 100%, but it's better. There are groups out there that you can hire to analyze your website. Some of them will do, do, a con will do the analysis for free, and then you can pay them for remediation. Um, it's hard. Um, anybody that knows the WCAG standards, anybody that's ever tried to code in them, knows that they're ambiguous at best. And you almost need a PhD in web design to use them effectively, which is why and my biggest thing with anybody that has a website is if somebody reports a problem to you, address the problem that was found. Don't try to take your whole website at once. You know, remediation is right. a process. But as they're, as they're found, acknowledge them and do your best. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for that. Um, Jesse, I, I see you, but I want to try to get to some of these, these questions. And please forgive me. Um, hold, can, you, can you put your, your question in the, in the chat and we will try to get to it? Yeah, Tony, it's just a, sort of a follow-up to what Laura is saying. I do have a question in the queue, but it's not a new question. I just wanted to know, for instance, my website was designed using Squarespace. Have you found... Because nowadays, most people don't really start from scratch creating it. Have you found that they're, like Squarespace is, is very popularly used? Does that one end up translating to something that visually impaired people can read? It depends. And I, I, I hate to use the um, catch-all, but it depends. It depends upon, like when you put images in, did you put the alt text in with your images? That may not be something that's done automatically. Um, the, any of the ARIA objects, do they have the right, a lot of it's tagging and that a lot of that unfortunately is a manual process. So anything you add to that template has to be manually tagged. I okay. hope that helps. Thank, thank yeah, you. Thank yeah, you, no, that, that's perfect. Thank and you. And Jesse, thank you for your, for your, uh, your question. Uh, we have, we have a few questions that I want to try to get to. I know uh, someone, someone had their hand up. I, I'm going to ask that, uh, let's, let's try to get to the questions and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll recognize the panel with, you know, questions that are not in the uh, Q and A. Emily Brusso asks, what is the best advice to give a senior or parents of a college age student with disabilities going off to college to prepare or advocate for in that situation? First thing I'm going to say is you need to educate yourself. The Individuals with Disabilities Act that I spoke about stops at 12th grade. You are now under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And there is a great saying that I will find somewhere. There's a, there's a graphic. I will find it. It says, IDEA guarantees success. ADA guarantees access. Those two statements say more. So get with the disability office early. Contact whoever that disability person is on your campus early. Talk to them, but make sure that there are great resources out there on the difference between high school and college for students with disabilities that talk about these laws. Access those resources. I know one of them's on the Department of Ed website. Yes, thank you, Emily. Um, I could go. I could go on for this for two, three hours just in itself. But that's Laura, the... I was just wondering. I I know I'm putting you on the spot. Can you lift up a couple of universities that you know that are sensitive to um, uh, students with disabilities? Most universities are at least compliant. I do know. Um, Oh, God. Now I can't remember. There's one in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I can't remember the name of it right off the bat. It's not coming to me. They are considered like the school for disabilities in the state of Pennsylvania. Georgia Southern in, in uh, Statesboro, Georgia does a very nice job. Um, I believe here at Lamar we do a decent job. Um, some of the Texas A&M schools have really good disability um, resource people. 
Okay. And, uh, and then I personally have friends in the disability office at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, so I'd be remiss to not say that there's a bias there on that one. I understand. And you, you shared that in our earlier conversation. Uh, Talak, well, let's, go, let's go with the next question. I'd like to add Colorado School for the Blind uh, is actually a pretty outstanding uh, school as well, and they help more than just the blind. Do they do post secondary? I'm sorry. Do they does Colorado School for the Blind do past twelfth grade? Yes, ma'am. I believe so. Absolutely. Okay. I know Hadley does. I know Hadley does some correspondence courses at the graduate at the. Uh, bachelor's level so yeah they had they have adult adult uh education as well yes thank you yep. thank Perez you Michael. asks for people who want to share their gifts and talents with those with disabilities what resources and groups can help direct you to those uh, uh receptive and in need of help um national uh, look up whatever you're interested in um Easter Seals is a great group, and so is like the National Federation for the Blind, American Council for the Blind. Um, there are some deaf advocacy groups out there. I'm not as connected to that community, um, but start with your local, um, your any of your local volunteer centers as well. Uh, community centers, places like that can quite often give you local resources as well. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Next question. Sky Gleason uh, in Seattle asks, is the word disability a disservice? Are there other words to create a more we conversation rather than an us them language? That is a very personal thing. I personally don't the, the words that are like absolute no's anymore are the handicapped, um, wheelchair bound. Um, they prefer what we call person first language. It's an acknowledgement that they're a person first. Instead of the wheelchair bound, it's person who uses a wheelchair. It is affirming them as a person first. Um, obviously, um, that comes down to personal preference, but I feel as long as you're acknowledging the person first, that's the best general rule. Um, there's, there's the, I, I was just in a forum the other day where they were talking about this differently abled versus disabled and how they, that, that's a conversation that's starting to be had in a lot of the disability communities that they pr still prefer disabled over differently abled because it, it's just, it's more cumbersome and 10 years, the answer might be different on that one. A cumbersome. John, John had a question. I'm, I'm sorry, Sky. Well, I just, the, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm receiving here is the word different and being a lexic again, or dyslexic, I, I have that and that other word invisible. And so I, I'm kind of really embracing the word different as a, as a, but with the human, the human element is that we all have red blood. So there I kind of embracing that word and maybe it's other people's disability to not use the word different. I don't know. It, it was just, it was a very interesting conversation that there is, there is that disabled basically shows that there's there's a you know yes we get it done differently but there is that deficit was what they were um kind of coming up with in uh this board who, and Amazon. who and who are they again <laughs> um it was a it's 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 a uh pri it's not a private board but it, it's a listserv that i am on um primarily with the blind community um through the National Association for the Blind, and they were talking about how they preferred the 
they, they almost felt it was patronizing with differently abled instead of disabled. They just felt that like it was patronizing to them. And I didn't get it, but it was a point that was brought up. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Yes, John Idelson. Well, I just wanted to follow on that. I think what terms we use and how we talk with other individuals, I think is critical. Um, like Sky, I'm dyslexic. Uh, the joke is I stay up at worry night. Is there a dog? Uh, in the sixth grade, I was labeled as a slow learner, put into the slow learning class where I learned to learn slowly. Uh, if I hadn't had parents who were advocates for me, um, I probably wanted to become a college professor. At, at my university teaching, I did a lot of work with our student services, and I called it student services, although the official name was Disabled Student Services, in that I mean, in working with my uh, college students, that we learned differently, we worked differently, and what might have been perceived as a slow learning or a dyslexia that made me different than everyone else was my strength exactly. as I got older. And I think that's the challenge is how not to put people in a position where our language around them hurts them, slows them down, makes them feel less about themselves. Thank well, you. And Thank dignity. You. Thank you, John. Thank dignity, you, John. dignity and respect as the, yes. as the, as the go-to first. I like that. Thank you. And the other Thank thing you, too Scott. is, is if you know their name, just use their name. And it's that, it's that simple. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Laura. We're, we're going to, we're going we're gonna to speed up a little bit now yes. because the, we, we, we want to keep it to the hour that we've promised. And we have people who are all over the world who are watching and listening, and we want to be attentive to that. And yes. so, uh, Talat, please go with the next question. Uh, DB asks, in this age of inclusion, is it acceptable to publicly refer to those with disabilities by uh, disability, i.e. my variable, wait, sorry, let me reread that. By disability, um, i.e. my variable, oh, my, my certain disability colleague, or uh, does that run the risk of being exclusive? My preference is, is they're your colleague first. Don't put the disability first. Um, we just kind of covered this, but again, they're still a person. And that, that human factor. Um, I get some pushback on that in different places. But and also, if, it does, if it's not relevant to the conversation, don't bring it up. And also, if they have a name, just refer to them by their name. Absolutely. Next question. Uh, sorry, I'm doing a lot of things here. Um, Jeff Francis asks, uh, can you can you describe or demonstrate the use of a screen reader? It can be uh, enlightening for those who have never experienced one. I I think I can do that. Give me oh yeah, let me give me one second. Or is there a, a website where we can go? That, I that have a video I can put in the resource list where I went through because I was doing some demos of of what a screen reader sounds like, and, I, and I'm sure there are a couple places that I can get them for you. Uh, Freedom Scientific's uh, YouTube page is great. I will add those to the resource list. Is, yeah, I, yes, I actually sir. did this oh. as a Go part ahead. of a course, and it was a it was an eye opening experience to actually sit down and attempt to use. A website and then my website that I was building with a screen reader and boy once you've done that you think about a lot of accessibility built into the website and using headers and things like that is it different from like uh, this afternoon I inadvertently hit control alt u or something on one of the browsers and brought up a read aloud feature that it had built in so I'm assuming is it is it extremely it's, different from that or? JAWS in particular gives you much more global control. It, it, you can do things like launch programs with it, um, tell it to read certain areas. It's all keyboard based. Imagine you didn't have a mouse. You could do everything you need to do from your keyboard. That's the 
thousand foot view of how it works. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Lou Perez asks, uh, what are some of the most helpful technologies available now or rumored in the near future for those with disabilities? I think that um, where we've come with screen readers, you know, and the iPad, the iPad had to be one of the most leveling for other disabilities. Um, speech disability, people that have uh, communication disorders. Um, they, they finally had something instead of being the size of a laptop or bigger that was small, compact, and, it, and now the iPad can do so many things. Um, I've seen them used for people who are non-communicative. I've seen it used, um, the one deaf person that I do spend a lot of time with has an iPad and that's her preferred way of communicating if she doesn't have an interpreter and she doesn't always want to have an interpreter with her. Yes, she needs it for her school and things of that nature in the classroom, but if she's just gonna have a conversation with you, she'd rather type it or write it on the iPad screen and do it that way. I, I, I can't help but jump in with, with this last uh, comment, Laura, that you just shared. So, um, um, I've done a lot of different things in the school system, but my, I think one of the most important jobs that I've had has been as a high school teacher for students with autism. But before um, I became a teacher in that classroom, I work with um, a special needs class that had a lot of different um, a lot of different disabilities. But the common denominator in that class was, and I, I had all of this information that I was gonna share about accessibilities and iPhones and iPads, but I, I, um, I, am, a, I, I am an admittedly Apple fanboy. I will say that publicly, I, I will admit that. But the reason, part of the reason why I am an Apple fanboy it's because in this classroom, we had the first and second generation iPads. And every student in the class had an iPad. And this class, the students were low functioning autistic students. And they were absolutely amazing Dang, in the what iPad. they could do with the iPad. Yes. And so, because they were able to do all of these amazing things with the iPad, Apple had created software um, that allowed them to be their best self. So um, I am a fanboy and I know that there are tons and tons of uh, assistive technology uh, devices out there but Apple, where they may have failed in some people's eyes as far as traditional education, they have stepped up, up with the assistive technology, technology and accessibilities. And, and so, voiceover um, for a long time was the cream of the crop when it came to mobile accessibility for the blind. Um, I use both. I haven't actually used Mac OS in years, but I do have an iPad, an older iPad. Actually, I actually have a second gen original iPad still. Um, but it's, it is, it's an amazing, it's amazing what you can do. Absolutely with amazing device. So I would, so let me just put this out there. If, if you can, and by all means, you can ignore me if you want to by all means, but I want to say any parent or grandparent that's, that's listening to me, okay. I'm encouraging you to make a sacrifice and get the low cost iPad. It can do all of the, all of the bells and whistles of accessibilities in the Apple infrastructure. Sacrifice, get the device for your child or grandchild, you will not be sorry if you do. 
I guarantee you. And if you are sorry, seek me out and you know, you know what you can do, beat me up. Okay. So, but I, but ser- in all seriousness, I think as far as, as students with disability, disabilities, it is the premier device that you can get. And you don't have to get a new one. You know, the new ones, the, the basic iPad is $329. You can get a used one. You can get a refurbished one. And so I encourage you to make the sacrifice and get that device for your child or grandchild. It's less than a dollar a day when you think about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Next question. Roscoe Jones asks, who has been the most inspiring student you have had the pleasure of working with? Is that to me or is that to, to Laura? I think that's to the panel. Okay. I've, I've had, I had a student that transferred in that was during COVID that was completely deaf and we were able to, she wanted to be an educator. She wanted to go get her teaching certificate here in Texas. And I was so proud of her as she came through. Um, she wanted to be a physical education teacher. And her ability to work with me and tell me what she needed and that she, when I when she graduated, I was probably the with her teacher certificate was probably one of the proudest days of my life. Um, seeing her succeed and go on to get to she started her master's this coming fall. She was almost a That's junior fantastic. when she transferred in. She got into the educator prep program and um, she, uh, and uh, you know. Again, getting her in early, getting her hooked up with resources. Um, there were some. I learned some things from her about some of the the financial side with students with disabilities that is different here than where I went to college. So, um, yes. Okay. It, it, every time you see them succeed, you just want to cheer. Right. Real quick. Yeah. I- I, real quick, I went to college with a person who was blind from death. He was in my, blind from birth. He was in my uh, dorm, and uh, he was the conference cham- champion Roman, Greco-Roman wrestler. He, he was a teacher who at one point uh, was teaching a class and of sighted kids and one of them decided to sneak out of the room and he waited until the kid got right near the door and he moves skillfully towards the door and he reached out and grabbed the kid at the last second i mean and he navigated the entire campus with just a small cane folding cane and my favorite story on him is he went on a date with a sighted girl and they went to a movie theater and when they came out, she took him clear around the block because she was confused and lost and she wouldn't admit it. And she finally told him, I'm really sorry, but we're, we're lost. He says, no, we're not here. Grabbed her hand and led her back to her dorm. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to answer that question? Okay. I don't, I don't see any hands, so I'm going to. I'm going to say next question. JJ McKenna asks, having raised two kids with both, uh, with both sides of the spectrum of support needs, why would you expect that the support systems in both the public and private education institutions appear to be willfully remiss in their requirements? It's Good. not. Laura, Laura, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I was going to. No, I want you to go ahead first, Laura. My opinion on that is because, number one, I think Tony will echo that in a general education classroom, the teachers may not know what their requirements under IDEA are. Um, Not all teachers are 
Uh, and that's not the only thing they have to do. They manage a classroom of 30 kids. You know, and the IDEA, the stepwise approach in under IDEA gets missed. The identification of the disability gets missed, not because somebody is being adversarial towards the child. It's not because they're being apathetic. It's because they are overwhelmed. I agree. And so uh, we had an earlier conversation of uh, advocacy. And so what I want to say to, to JJ is that um, you have to look at the resources that are around you. And by that, I mean, you have to look for local agencies that will give you support for your child or for your children locally. And also don't be afraid to reach out to um, if, if you're a person of faith, reach out to that community. Um, reach out to, to public figures. Search um, the internet. Sometimes, search the internet. Find search the, the internet. Almost every disability has a national advocacy group. Absolutely. Absolutely. Educate um, yourself. Educate yourself. You know, I, I shared the story about my mother-in-law and the reason why I, I lifted her up because she was tenacious in what she wanted for her grandson. She did not let anybody tell her what he could not have. And if, if you don't have a local agency, look, and, and this is not gonna be popular among educators, but I wanna say this because I think it's important. Look in your local areas for attorneys that work with families that have children that are in the midst of, uh, I'm trying to say this in a nice way, um, or advocates for the child. Yes. And you have to have advocates that their first priority is always the child or the student. That's what it's all about. And when you, when you are sitting up in an IEP meeting, you can actually ask whomever you want to be, be in that meeting. And at a and certain you, point, the student has a right to be there. At a certain that's right. grade level, the student has a right to be there. And if they that's are right. excluding the student, there's a problem. Right. And so it's important that you reach out to those resources that are around you. A lot of times there are people around you that will help you, but they don't know that you need help. So you need to make known your needs. And, and sometimes, and, 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 and I want to say this, be like my mother-in-law in that she was tenacious in getting what she needed for her grandson and, and for her son as well. And so, um, John, go ahead, John. I was going to say, it, 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 it's basically an equity issue that is not only this institution's problems, but society. When I was first identified with my learning disability, there were no laws. There were no individualized learning plans. I get it. So the fact that we have them and we fall short is so much better than when we don't have them at all. And I think part of the challenge that I saw on my campus is it was an education problem. Many times people weren't aware, so we had to educate people. If you didn't have a child or knew someone with a disability, so sometimes it's ignorance. Sometimes it is in fact just resistance. And it's resistance because society hasn't made available the resources that are needed. So I, I, in my years of teaching, I haven't run into any faculty member or staff member who didn't want to do the best that they could for their students. But many times there were many barriers that were placed there. And I think it's very frustrating well, when schools don't meet like their obligations. But uh, I have a hard time only blaming the schools because the schools are really doing what society allows to get by.
Thank you, John. Absolutely. It is. Thank it's you, a culture. John. It's a culture. And it's a culture that the more we talk about, the more we have conversations like this, the more maybe something will change in one area. And, and I think that the question that, that J.J. was asking, um, and I, I, I can't presume, but I, but I do think that he has had some challenges, and that was the reason why he asked the question in the first place. And we know that there are people who are having some challenges. Yeah. And so I, I just say that a lot of times what you can do, the best thing to do is to let people know that you are ha having challenges and maybe they can then help you out. Go ahead, Scott, real quick, because we're yes, actually I think the quick, over. The, yep, the quick delineation would be the difference between the advocate, which is your mother who has great passion, and the specialist that has the knowledge, education, and resources. Then, and so the, when helping hurts con conversation often is we come in with great passion, but we actually do more damage. And so my, my, I, what I'm hearing is the passion is absolutely required, but you may not have the specialty at the moment, but you may become the specialist because you've got the passion to find the resources needed for that specific instance. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And the one other Absolutely. resource I am going to quickly is um, there's a group out there called the ARC. I don't know now. I know what it used to stand for, but that is a very politically incorrect term anymore. But it, it's an intellectual um, disability advocacy group. And uh, developmental and intellectual disabilities is what they have on their thing now. But they still use the acronym ARC. And they are um, they're a force to be reckoned with if you've ever worked with them. And it doesn't matter what really the issue is. They will normally reach out and help you get the ball rolling in the right direction. Okay, next question. JJ McKenna also asks, what escalation paths have you seen used to address the uh, constant blocks that exist within sco the school districts? Okay, I'm going to take this from a little different because uh, Tony asked me to tell this story. When I transferred from Indiana University of Pennsylvania to Georgia Southern, I had an issue where I was being paid for by the Vocational Rehabilitation of Georgia. And they, they the state doesn't pay the state out-of-state tuition because I had moved from Pennsylvania. I was considered an out-of-state student. And... Um, they weren't giving me my, there was this waiver I needed to get in-state tuition, but I had gone to the, and it was supposed to go through the admissions office. I had gone to the person in admissions. I had emailed, I had called, I had physically gone up there and they had denied me access to this person. This person literally told me that that waiver did not apply to me unless a doctor had told me that moving from Pennsylvania to Georgia would increase my vision. Now I knew that was absolutely crazy, but <laughs> I, so I went for three weeks. I went at it as hard as I could. Everybody I could talk to, but I couldn't find the actual policy. It it was, um, but but I knew it was at the upper echelons of the 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 system. It wasn't a school policy. It belonged to the state. So I emailed somebody at the state. I on a Saturday on a whim because I was frustrated. I found a general email box for the state education board, and I emailed them. I said, "Can you just here's what I've done. Here's what I'm being told." can you send me a copy of the policy? Cause I want to go talk to the, the next person up the chain and I'm at the director of admissions and I'm not getting anywhere. So the next person up the chain would be enrollment management, but I don't want to do that until I am well versed in what this policy says. I sent this about two o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday afternoon. Monday was the first day of school. I'm coming out of my like 10, the class got out at like 1030. My cell phone rings. It is the vice president of enrollment management herself asking me to come to her office. <laughs> Let's just say at the end of that, for, for brevity's sake, the issue was fixed. Somebody from the Atlanta had called the campus and it was fixed. Now to their credit, they only had done like two of these in the previous five years, but the fact that nobody would look it up was the issue. Fantastic. Next question. JJ asks, 
Does it make sense to contact the Secretary of Education when the college or university has professors who refuse to provide the mandated ac accommodations established by the students, student resource centers? No. Absolutely. The first place you're going to start is you're going to you're going to start with I had a situation when I was in college. I had a service dog. Um, my, 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 my guide dog is currently retiring, but he was just being I had just been placed with me. And I had a professor that tried to throw him out of class because somebody was afraid. This went to this stopped at the university um, lawyer because I went to the disability office. If the professor is not giving the student what they need, the next step is the disability service office that wrote the accommodation letter. Then it goes to university legal and it's probably not gonna get any further than that. Um, know the Department of Ed regs, know why and what, but the Secretary of Education only if you've gone through all the steps because you're going to get a better, faster response than contacting the Department of Ed. That can be just two weeks waiting for an answer to an email. Thank you, Laura, I'm sorry, for correcting Tony. me. I'm that's sorry. Okay. You, you corrected me on that, and, and, and that's, that's what we needed to hear. So thank you. We're, listen, we're here to get the information and to learn from each other. Yes, that's why we're I here. Did, I didn't want to. I, I'm, I'm not the type to correct somebody, though, normally. That's okay. That's all right. Next question. JJ McKenna asks, should the cost of recertifying for support when a student has graduated out of their classification remain on the student? That depends. Uh, K through 12, that is at the, 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 that is on the school to do that. It's something called a free and appropriate, appropriate public education. At the university level, um, most likely they've been followed by a doctor that can do that medical documentation through their lives. If they haven't, um, ADHD is the one that I know there's a specific test is required. Um, that there's specific diagnostic criteria and it has to be spoken to very specifically. That one, I do believe that it, the cost, if there's a cost for it, it's on the student. Um, I've known a couple universities that could do it very, very inexpensively because they, they had PhD psychology pro programs and their psychology students did it at a discount for the other students. Okay. Next question. Chris Clark asks, a grandson on the autism spectrum completed high school with honors. In, in the freshman year of college, he was reluctant to identify himself as needing support. How might one encourage college students or younger to take advantage of the help available? The first thing I always tell them is that the, 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 the help that you need is going to be, number one, it's private. There's only certain things they can disclose and you're going to get a education plan and it is up to you whether you put the, the they'll put the accommodations on the plan and they'll stand behind you but they are not necessarily going to unless you give them permission the disability office cannot identify what your disability is to your professors they are disability offices because they deal with medical information, they are actually bound by two laws normally, not just one. Um, Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act, but they also are quite often deal, deal with, and this is a little bit of a gray area, but the Healthcare Information Privacy and Portability Act. And um, you have choice, you have control, but you also need to know that that's going to set you up for success. Again, go back to the difference between the IDEA and the ADA. Um, it's to their benefit. And usually my thing is, is once they're struggling, then I sit them down and say, look, you know, this is your future. This is 
it's a reality. And I quite often just come have it's like, hey, let me call um, the disability office. I happen to know the director. I happen to know the assistant director or whatever. Let's have a conversation. And as an advisor, as I sit there and I open those doors, um, I've actually been known to go to meetings with some of my students because they felt comfortable talking to me. And again, there's a FERPA waiver involved there. Um, but te it, it teach by example. Step up and have them, you know, lead them. Um, there's a theory out there called challenge and support. We need to challenge our students, but we also have to support our students. And uh, that's individualized to every student. So I can speak in generalities, but um, I hope something I said helps. Thank, thank you, Laura. Uh, John, real quick. Yeah, I'm going to be a little contradictory in this. Uh, not that you're not the expert, but I just have a slightly different opinion. And that is he's of the majority age right now. And I think you have to let him make his own choices in this matter. You have to let him know that you have his back and that if he needs help, you're there to help him out, but that it's his choices to make going forward yes. because to do otherwise takes away their agency yeah, yeah. and, and makes them less, le less equal. I think in a lot yeah. of ways, I never take away their agency. If I, if I, if I came across that way, I'm sorry. I start the conversation, you know, I always say to them, you know, if you're uncomfortable, I can assist in these. This is the menu of options you have for me to assist you, but you have to tell me what you're willing for me to do. So it, 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 it may come across a little bit just because of my passion, but yes, I always give my I, students their choices. I never took that from, as the way you were saying it. I just want to make it clear that as an adult, they have the right to make bad choices sometimes they do, and poor but, choices. But this but, is how I advise them. And I'm not saying you shouldn't. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying we need to let them make the choices and and be there to support them when they come and ask for help or realize they need help. Yeah. Thank you, John. Totally Appreciate agree. That. Next question. David Brady says, "Is being an ally a better strategy than being an advocate?" <sighs> Allies and advocates each have their own place and I encourage everyone no matter your skill level to be an ally in my book the difference between an ally and an advocate is advocates are just much more vocal you know we're putting it out there um, but everybody I encourage to be an ally next question uh, I believe that's it. Let me just scrape the uh, chat real quick to see if we didn't make Okay, this. great, great. And so um, we, we're about uh, 13 minutes over, and I know we could go on uh, for some time with this. Um, Laura, I think you have a, a lab for us? Yes, let me grab that really quickly. Um... And while Laura's doing that, I, I want to um, to share this because I think it's important. So part of what conversations with Tony Mobley is about is that we are going to try to involve people who are not members of office hours with actually cutting or controlling the show or the conversation. And what I'm asking my office hour friends who are here is I want you, when you can, to mentor these people, these young people, these older people, these people of any age who want to learn how do you cut a Zoom meeting? Yes. And so we we are going to be reaching out to um, we're going to be reaching out to people with disabilities. We're going to be reaching out to anybody who has an interest. 
We want you to connect with Conversations with Tony Mobley. There is a resource, it's called um, Help with Conversations with Tony Mobley. Put your name in and we will, uh, we will get back to you. I'm ready whenever you're ready, Tony. I'm All right. Go ahead and share my screen. Is that okay? Thank. Yes. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. One of the biggest questions I get is, "What can you see?" And um, in the resources that I just posted in the chat, there's something above it called Misunderstood Minds. That website is now not working because of Flash. But I found this one, and it's a vision simulator. And what it is, is you can see the picture, and if you slide it, it will show you. This, I believe, is, this is the nearsightedness. And you can see that, and it's not showing up really, really well on the screen share. But you can go in, and the link is in the resources. You can play with it. And the left side is 2020 vision, and as you slide it across, it kind of gives you an idea of what each of the, um, they're down here at the bottom, nearsightedness, farsightedness, colorblindness, cataracts, glaucoma is a good one. This is, this is what normal people see. That's what somebody with glaucoma is going to see. Can you tell how the outside's kind of coming? It's getting dark on the edges and only the center is in focus. But that, yes. is, that link is in the um, resources that I just put in the chat. And um, I encourage you to just kind of go play with that. It doesn't go through every possibility for vision impairments. But I just want to say this in closing. Please remember that 90 to 95% of the people who carry the label of blind have some vision remaining. Be that light perception all the way up through 20 over 200 are all considered some degree of blind. But that does not mean that everything is black, that all they see is blackness. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for that. Thank you so much for that. And so, um, and so we're going to, we're going to wrap up now and I'm going to allow five minutes for the panelists, if they want to quickly share their thoughts or uh, a reference and then I'm going to have my closing remarks and we will end. Laura, let me just say um, before anyone goes, thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. I think, I think that this was amazing. And, and I, I encourage everyone, the, the link that Laura has shared in terms of the resources will be a part of conversations with Tony Mobley. And so... Um, no, I'm going to just stop talking there. So, Ray, yes, sir. You're muted, Ray. You're a lot quieter than we anticipated. You're still quiet. Okay. You got to get well, that button. Try this one. Ray. I, I'm going to get that button. Uh, I just want to put in a good word for Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. It is one of the top universities for the deaf in the world yes. and however many of the deaf people i know go to all of the normal universities yes. attend normal classes with an interpreter and that is completely possible as well but gallaudet is dedicated to the deaf community thank you ray it's a lot i i just wanted to uh speak to the importance of art um and not just for uh, any one group, for all of us. You know, we have, I have blocks about certain things and sometimes just going to look at art or going to see art or going to hear art um, and, and, and creating art can break through certain, uh, certain spots. And so I had the wonderful opportunity to work with a, a company called VSA 
um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where they had an art center where people of, of a variety of, dis, of, dis, of abilities, disabilities in, on the mental uh, sphere, disabilities on the physical sphere, all, all, all sorts were able to make pottery, paint, uh, dance. There was a dance, there was a dance company, there was a theater company. And then they were able to uh, sell their, their artwork and keep the money for themselves. And um, I thought some of the most beautiful, beautiful, beautiful pieces I've ever seen came out of there. And it's, you know, it's, it's because they're human beings and, and they're making beautiful work and they're, and, and, and that is a, and also, I think there's also, uh, uh, I want to wrap up quickly here, but there's also some benefit to whatever uh, uh, difficulty anyone may be having by creating and seeing something come from their hands. And I just wanted to say that. Yes, John. We talked about that, you know, sometimes the support really isn't there. Um, my story is that I had a English teacher who failed me because she would not make any accommodations. She gave weekly quizzes that were 10 points, but they were short answer. By the end of the term, I had negative points because even though the question was worth 10 points, if I misspelled more than 10 words, she counted negative points. So I had negative 800 points, was dropped out of the college prep program, was told I'd never make it to college. You, um, two things happened. When I got accepted to college, it made her think about you know what she did. But also the fact that I knew any misspelled word in the 10 point question was gonna be taken off. It made me become very selective of what words I use. That skill helped me in writing, helped me get through my dissertation. So even those negative experiences, when the rules aren't followed and the support is not there, in the long run was a benefit. So I, I hope that that gives some people hope when they don't get the support they need. Really quickly, Absolutely. John, that brings up a story for me. When I was in junior high school, we had two gym teachers. We had a women's gym teacher and men's gym teacher, even though our co -ed, they were co-ed classes, one taught in gym A and one taught in gym B, and you had two gym classes running at the same time. We were playing crab soccer on scooters with this great big, it looked like a beach ball, but it was fabric. And I was having issues. I was just having a really bad day with, because we were down and we were kind of back. The lighting was bad because there's those, those horrible skylights at the gym. And I was just scared of getting hurt. Well, the women's gym teacher threw me out of class and knocked me down for it for the day. So every two weeks you swip flop teachers. So the next two weeks, we went over to the other, the male gym teacher, and he was, we were playing saw crab soccer again with the, um, the, the scooters, but now we were using a standard soccer ball. And after being thrown out of gym class and, and having all kinds of things done to me because I wasn't trying to participate, I got in the second week, and the, this is like the very next gym class, and I, I was in there just chasing the ball and I didn't see one of the biggest kids in the, in the grade above me try to get to the ball. He managed to kick the ball, hit me in the head, and then his foot hit my head. Oh, wow. Be but this was before the ADA, and it was, you know, because, you know, I had been shamed and told I was wrong for being careful. And then went out and got myself hurt, so... There is, there's always good in things, but there is also times that things can go wrong that aren't necessarily useful. Chris, go ahead quickly. Thank you. Uh, one thought I had is that uh, so much of the way we do public education involves uh, what I call convergent education. That is the idea that we're going to really good do a really good job of having everybody get an A and uh, look similar to one another and keep your eyes on your own paper. Don't collaborate or cooperate with anyone else. Uh, you need to master the same set of skills and behavioral objectives as everyone else. Uh, versus um, what I think makes more sense 
in the real world is that is what I call divergent education. That each of us is a, it comes to school different from everyone else. Each of us leaves school different than everyone else. And typically we work in teams where what Laura brings to the table is different than what Talak brings to the table. And we meld that together in a way that makes it stronger than if we were all identical in our abilities and skills and so forth. So I just like to make a pitch for thinking differently about um, the purpose and the path of schooling, that it, it shouldn't be anymore to try to, to produce uh, interchangeable parts, uh, people who are the same as one another, but rather uh, to produce people who can work well with others, uh, bringing their gifts to the table and having them received and, and complimented by those of others. I'll stop right there. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And so we're going, we're going to actually end the show at this time. Um, and I just have to uh, uh, ask my, my co-pilot to lock, uh, am I forgetting anything? You're, you're quiet. Muted. Everybody, uh, please come back next week and talk with us again. <laughs> okay. Tony, yes. Tony, I think you're going to have to give up on the fiction that this is going to be an hour discussion. You <laughs> haven't kept it to an hour in three weeks. <laughs> We're just and, being and, real, and, man. Just being real. Okay. Okay, John. I, we may not. We may not be able to, but we're, we're going we're gonna to work toward improving that. We're actually getting worse, but we're going to work toward going in the other direction. So real quickly, let me just lift up a couple of things. And I just, I have to do this. Um, so I want to thank uh, the Global Family and Friends. I want to thank Alice Lindsay and Office Hours members. I want to thank the DVE store that powered this Zoom webinar. Video 360 webcam, which I'm using, which I look good in. I know I look good. And this is this is through Video 360. They were, and I have to say this, they were giving cameras out to teachers at the beginning of the pandemic when the teachers could not find cameras to do their virtual instruction. So I have to lift them up. And I have, to, I have to also lift up Mr. Ken Jordan of the UK. The reason why I lift him up is because you guys, anybody who has actually had an opportunity to look at my website, that is the work of Mr. Ken Jordan. He also has provided the help page as well. And so um, I, again, I wanna thank you all so much Next week is going to be a powerful week. Ms. Liberty White will be on next week. She is the owner of a video production company. It's called Chosen Media. And she will be with us uh, next Wednesday night. And uh, we are excited we're excited to, to hear from her as a special guest. And I can tell you already, it's gonna be awesome. So you need to be here if you can. Um, and, and the last thing is, uh, again, thank you panel. Thank you Jalot. Thank you everybody. We'll see you next week. The links that Laura has shared will be on the webpage. And I have, I have one that I was gonna to share too, which is about assistive technology and some of the resources and what assistive te technology actually is and the resources. And then also we have the, all of the information about the Apple uh, accessibilities uh, resources that you can use on your Apple devices. Tony, and so can you with send that, those links to me, I can put them right on the resource sheet. 
Absolutely, I can do that. So again, thank you all so much. Thank you, panel. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night, everyone. Take care. We will see you 